Ta-da! Let's begin this Mordheim rules run through with a few of the basic rules. Characteristics. Just as in Warhammer Fantasy, we use here characteristics for our Mordheim games. Consider for example this orc boy. M stands for movement, 4 inches. WS is weapon skill of 3. BS is ballistic skill of 3. S is strength of 3. T is toughness of 4. W is the number of wounds, in this case 1. I is initiative, 2. A is number of attacks, in this case 1. LD is leadership of 7. Over the course of the games, models will be required to take different characteristic tests. In this case, let's look at the orc boy and take a strength test. The orc's strength is a 3, so we roll a d6 and on a 1, 2, or 3 he passes. On a 4, 5, or 6 he will fail the test. There's a 2, he passes the test. The same principle applies to all characteristics. So even if we were to take an initiative test, in this case we have a poor initiative of two, we would need to roll a one or two to pass, three, four, five would fail. So a five in this case would be a fail of that initiative test. Leadership tests are run slightly differently. In this case, you use 2d6 in order to roll. What you need to do first is look at the leadership for your model. In this case with our orc boy, it is a seven, and you roll your 2d6 and anything that is equal to or less passes. In this case, we got an eight, and that is a fail on the leadership test. Mordheim, just like Warhammer Fantasy, is a turn-based game, which means that one player is allowed to take a full turn with different phases, and then the next player is able to take a turn with different phases. Each of the turns is split into four distinct phases, and here is the turn sequence. First, the recovery phase, Second, the movement phase. Third, the shooting phase. And fourth, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Let's go ahead now and look at each of these phases in more detail using these three models here from the Empire, the Orcs and Goblins, and the Skaven. Recovery phase. During the recovery phase, you may attempt to rally any of your models who have lost their nerve. For example, let's say that this orc boy begins his turn by fleeing. Let's roll 2d6 to see if he will be able to stop of the leadership of 7. Uh, no, we got a 10, which means that he will continue to run towards the nearest board edge with 2d6 inches, 8 inches. And 8 inches will bring him right over here. Now had he rolled under his leadership of 7, say for example a 6, he would immediately be able to rally and to turn in any direction he so desires. In this case we will face back to that Empire Gunner. Note however that the model cannot move or shoot for the rest of the turn, but models able to do so can cast spells. Note that a model cannot rally if the closest model to him is an enemy model. Fleeing, stunned, knocked down, and hidden models are not taken into consideration for this. So in this example, uh, were there to be an Empire Archer here within 8 inches of this fleeing Orc boy, he would not be able to take a rally test and would have to continue towards the board edge. In addition, during the recovery phase, warriors in your warband who have been stunned, such as this Archer, become knocked down instead, and turn them on their back, and those who have been knocked down may now stand up. We will cover this specific rule in more detail when we get to the injury section. The movement phase. The movement phase is divided into three sub-phases. First, charge. Second, compulsory moves. And third, remaining moves. Here are a few general principles for moving. 
Models will always move now according to their move characteristic. In the case of this Empire Archer now, which is a human being, we have a movement rate of 4 inches. So he can move 4 inches in any direction as part of his normal move over crates um, that are 1 inch or lower, uh, over any sort of obstacles. He can even move up ladders a total of 4 inches, um, and he can move in any direction. The benefit of a normal move is simply this. If we were to move our normal four inches, this model would still be allowed to shoot in the shooting phase. If he were to run uh, in contrast, which is double his normal movement, he would not be able to shoot. So were this archer to run, he would be able to move up to eight inches. So that could bring him potentially all the way over here. It is important to remember, however, that a model can only run if there are no enemy models within 8 inches of it at the start of the turn. Once again, fleeing, stunned, knockdown, and hidden models do not count. So for example, in this case of the archer, um, this orc boy is within 8 inches, so were he to attempt to run, we would then measure it and see that he is in fact within 8 inches, which would mean he could only go his normal 4. Were the orc boy further than 8 inches away, it is possible then for this archer to run within 8 inches of him. But remember, the only way to engage another model is to declare a charge at the beginning of the movement phase. And once again, were this model to run, he would be unable to shoot in this phase, although it is still possible to cast spells after running. Charging. If you want a model to engage the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, then you must make a special move called a charge. Without measuring the distance, declare that your model is charging and indicate which enemy model he is going to attack. In this case, we will have this archer declare a charge upon this orc boy. Remember that it is only possible to charge if your model is able to draw a direct line of sight to the model that it will be charging. In this case, there is nothing obstructing the view here, so we can say there is indeed a direct line of sight. Were this orc boy to be hidden behind these crates blocking the line of sight, then it would not be possible for this archer to declare a charge. It is nevertheless still possible for your model to charge an enemy that it cannot see if it is within four inches of that model. Now the model may be behind a corner or in this case behind boxes. And it's important to know however that the model that is out of line of sight has not been declared as hidden. We will talk a bit about hiddenness in a little bit. Let us say then that this orc boy is out of line of sight of this archer, but he is not indeed hidden. The archer is within 4 inches, so he can declare a charge if he passes an initiative test. In this case, we have an initiative of 3, so let's roll our d6, and he gets a 5, which means he fails. A failed initiative test means that he may move as normal, shoot and cast spells as normal, but he may not charge. Had the archer passed his initiative test, say if he rolled a 2, he then would be able to come into combat with this orc boy even though the orc boy began out of his line of sight. Charging therefore is something like a running move in that it is double the distance of a normal movement, but what this does is it brings our models into base-to-base -base contact, which means that they are now in combat. Models may even be considered to be in combat if they are separated by a low wall. In this case, even though their bases are not touching, they are said to fight their combat over the wall and over the obstacle. An important rule to take consideration of when charging is the intercepting rule. What the intercepting rule means is that a model may not charge if there is another model within two inches of the charging route. Were the Model 2 declare a charge, it would then be intercepted. So let's take this example now of the Archer and the Orc Boys. Were this Orc Boy in the middle to be 3 inches out of the line that we draw between these two, this Archer would still be able to charge and the Orc Boy would not be able to intercept. Were this orc boy in the middle though, within a two inch distance, when this guy attempts to charge, what will happen is he will be intercepted by this other orc. What that means then is that these two models will then be in combat. 
For the sake of simplicity then, instead of charging over here, it is possible then for this guy simply to declare a charge onto him. Remember that there's no pre-measuring now in declaring charges. So sometimes a charging warrior may not reach the enemy because you have miscalculated the distance. So for example, in this case, the Empire Archer here has a charge range of eight. Were you to declare a charge, you would have to measure it out and see if it would be possible. Once we have made our measurement, we see now that the Empire Archer is indeed beyond his charge range. He has an 11 inch distance to the other model. This would therefore be a failed charge, and what we would do then is to move our archer his normal movement of four inches. Having failed this charge, this model may now not shoot this turn, although if he is able to, he may cast spells. An additional important point, the only way that it is possible to come into combat with another model is by declaring a charge. Any movement that brings you into base-to-base -base contact in combat is therefore by definition a charge. If you can move your warrior into base contact with more than one enemy model with its charge move, it can charge them both. So for example, with this Empire Archer, he may declare a charge on one of those Orc Boys, and he may in fact move up to the point where his base is in contact with both. In this combat, we therefore have three models now who will be fighting. Now this move might indeed be inadvisable for this Archer in that he will now be fighting two enemies at once. The Hiding Rule the hiding rule represents warriors concealing themselves in a way that our unmoving and dramatically posed models cannot. A hiding warrior keeps as still as possible, just peeking out of cover. A model can hide if he ends his move behind a low wall, a column, or in a similar position where he could reasonably conceal himself, say behind certain obstacles. The player must declare that the warrior is hiding and place a hidden counter beside the model for it to count as being hidden. So for example, were this archer now to end his move behind this big pile of crates and other items, we could say that he is now hidden. We will declare him hidden and put a hidden marker on him. It is important to remember that this is a special move. So a model that runs, flees, is stunned, or charges cannot hide that turn. His sudden burst of speed does not give him time to hide. A model may stay hidden for several turns so long as he stays behind a wall or similar feature or obstruction. He may even move around so long as he stays hidden while doing so. So for example, we may say that this archer may continue along this wall of obstacles and remain hidden the entire time. Were an enemy model now to move into a position where he would be able to see the hidden warrior, the hidden warrior is no longer hidden and removes his hidden counter. Hiding is a great benefit for this reason. When hidden, a model cannot be seen, shot at, or charged. Say for example that this were an orc error boy and he moved up to this position and he did not have line of sight on our archer over here, he would not be able to shoot and neither would he be able to charge that archer. Of course, were this orc able to move into a position where he would then be able to see the archer, the archer would then lose his hidden status. To maintain its hidden status now, this archer cannot shoot or cast spells. If it does so, it reveals its position and then can be shot at and charged at as normal. A model may not hide if he is too close to an enemy model. He will be seen or heard no matter how well concealed. Enemy warriors will always see, hear, or otherwise detect hidden foes within their initiative value in inches. So for example, were this archer to be here, he would not be able to be hidden because this orc boy has an initiative of two, which means he can see all hidden figurines and warriors within two inches. Let us briefly say something about terrain in Mordheim. Open ground. The tabletop surface, the floors of buildings, and connecting overhangs, ladders, and ropes are all considered to be open ground and will not affect movement even if the model is charging. The model can also go through doors and hatches without slowing down. Difficult ground. 
Difficult ground includes steep or treacherous slopes, bushes, and the angled roofs of buildings. Models move at half speed over difficult terrain. So for example, if our archer were climbing on this angled roof, he would only be able to move two inches instead of his normal four. Very difficult ground. This is really dangerous terrain such as narrow crawl holes through the rubble. Models may move at a quarter rate. So for example, if our model here moves four inches over open ground, it can only move one inch over difficult ground. In this case, to move through this small crawl hole. Walls and barriers. Walls, hedges, and other low obstacles form barriers that you can either go around or leap over. A model can leap over a barrier that is less than one inch high. This does not affect movement in any way. So in this case with this Empire Archer, he is able to cross this low wall which is less than an inch high without any hindrance to his movement. And of course a good rule of thumb with terrain is always talk to your opponent before you begin games and talk about the different kinds of terrain pieces and come up with some agreed upon definitions so that you can avoid having conflicts about those pieces later. Oftentimes the ruined buildings of Mordheim did not have stairs or ladders so your warriors will have to climb to reach the upper floors of buildings. Any model except for animals can climb up or down fences, walls, etc. Now he must be touching what he wants to climb at the start of his movement phase. He may climb up to his total movement in a single movement phase, but cannot run while he is climbing. Any remaining movement can be used as normal. If the height is more than the model's normal move, he cannot climb the wall. So for example, in this case of the archer who has a normal movement of four, he is unable to climb this wall in that it is almost five inches tall. Were he, however, to have begun his movement phase touching the wall on top of this crate, the distance would then be less than four inches and he would then be able to successfully climb this wall and move on to the edge of the platform. In order to begin to climb, however, the model must first pass an initiative test. In this case, with our archer, we have an initiative of three. So we will roll a d6, and we got it with a two. In this case, he is now able to climb up the wall. Were he have to fail the initiative test, if he rolled, for example, a four, five, or a six, he would not be able to climb up, and he would not be able to move any more that turn. In contrast, if the archer were to fail his initiative test while climbing down, he would fall from where he started his descent. We will talk more about this when we talk about falling. Jumping down. Your warrior may jump down from high places up to a maximum height of six inches, such as walkways and balconies, at any time during his movement phase. Take an initiative test for every full two inches he jumps down. So for example, let's say this archer wants to jump down from here, and let's say for the, this example that this is exactly six inches. He will have to take an initiative test for each two inch increment, so a total of three initiative tests. If the archer fails any of the tests, he falls from the point where he jumped, and he takes damage, which we'll discuss in the falling section, and he may not move any more during the movement phase. If he's successful, however, the model can continue his movement as normal. Jumping down does not use up any of the model's movement allowance. So to return to this example, our archer could move one inch to the end, jump down to six inches. If he passes all of his tests, he could still move three more inches, and that would be a normal move. It is also possible to carry out what is called a diving charge. You may charge any enemy troops that are below a balcony or overhang, etc., that your model is on. If an enemy model is within two inches of the place where your warrior lands, he may make a diving charge against it. So for example, were this orc boy here to be within two inches of where this archer would land, he can now make a diving charge against that orc boy. So once again, we need to take an initiative test for each full two inches of height that our model jumps down, up to a maximum of six inches. So once again, three more initiative tests. If we were to fail any one of those three tests, our model would simply fall down and take damage where he lands. He would not be able to move any more during his movement phase and he cannot charge the enemy. Were he successful then, having passed three initiative tests, he would be able to jump down land here and come into base contact 
with that model, thus receiving his plus one strength bonus and plus one hit bonus for the next hand-to-hand -hand combat phase. Jumping over gaps. Models may jump over gaps and streets up to a maximum of three inches. So for example, from the roof of a building to another. Deduct the distance jump from the model's movement, but remember that you cannot measure the distance before jumping. If your model does not have enough movement to jump the distance, he automatically falls. So in the case of this archer, I had declared that I would like to jump. Now I have a movement of four inches, and after I declare the jump, I go and measure it, and I see that it is exactly three inches, so he will be able to make that jump. Once we know we are able to make the jump, we then have to take an initiative test. With a roll of two, we now pass the initiative test, which means that we are able to make this jump successfully. We move our three inches across, and we can even move an additional one inch to end right there. Now it is possible to make the jump while running, which might be smart because you'll have extra distance when you land on the other side of your three inch maximum jump. Having made the leap, this archer may now shoot as long as he did not run uh, and use missile weapons like normal. In the shooting section, we will talk a bit more about what it means to be knocked down or stunned. But for now, we can just simply note that if a warrior is knocked down or stunned when standing within one inch of the edge of a roof or building, there's a chance that it will slip and fall off. So in this case of the archer, we need to take an initiative test. If the test is failed, the model falls over the edge of the ground and takes damage as detailed below in falling. If, however, for example, this archer does pass the initiative test and is simply knocked down, we will just lay him down like we would normally without having him fall off the ledge. Falling. A model that falls takes D3 hits at a strength equal to the height in inches that it fell. So for example, with this archer, who is six inches above the ground, were he to fall off of here for any reason, whether being hit or whether he tries to jump down and does not successfully make it, he will now take D3 hits at strength six because he is six inches above the ground. And of course, no armor saves are allowed for wounds taken by falling. Let's say now that the archer fell off of that uh, platform and he will now take D3 hits. So that will be a total of two hits. And strength six fall versus a toughness of three. We'll be wounding on twos, and there is one wound. It is important to note that falling will not cause critical hits. We'll talk more about critical hits in the hand-to-hand -hand combat section. Would our archer have survived the fall, he would not be able to move or hide at all in the remainder of this turn. We may now move on to the shooting phase. During your warband shooting phase, each of your warriors may shoot once with one of his weapons. This means that he can fire a bow, shoot with a crossbow, or hurl a throwing knife, for example. In addition, within the shooting phase, we will also be able to cast spells. We will touch upon those at the end of this discussion of shooting. To begin, the shooting team now selects one of its figurines that we'll be shooting and it picks out a target that it will be shooting at. We then figure out hits and wounds and then move on to our next one and pick out a target, figure out hits and wounds, and then go to our last one. And in this way, we will go through each of our models one at a time. Each model can shoot once in the shooting phase, so long as he can see a target and assuming he has a suitable weapon. A model may not fire in the following circumstances. If he is engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, such as is the case here, if he has run or failed a charge in the movement phase, if he has rallied this turn, or if he is stunned or knocked down, such as is the case here. In this particular situation, then the only model able to fire is going to be this archer right here. To shoot at a target, a model must be able to see it. And the only way to check this is to stoop over the tabletop for a model's eye view. So come down here and look from this archer's view. You can see all around him 360 degrees. You may turn the model in any way whatsoever, but it's important that you move from the eyes of the archer to the target. If you can draw a line of sight, then you're able to fire. 
Some gamers even find it helpful to use a laser in this situation so you can trace from the head, the eyes of the archer right over to the uh, target for its shot. Closest target. When standing on ground level, you must shoot at the closest enemy as he represents the most immediate threat and therefore the most obvious target. So in this case, if we have a choice between these two orcs, this archer will have to shoot over on that guy. An exception to this rule is that you may shoot at a more distant target if it is easier to hit or if closer models are stunned or knocked down. So for example, we have a uh, knockdown model here, so we do not have to fire at that one in that he does not represent a threat. This guy over here is behind cover, which makes him more difficult to hit. And this guy over here is in the open, so he actually is the easiest shot. So we may in fact shoot at him even though he is the furthest away. A good rule of thumb for this kind of shooting is simply this. Always shoot first at the model that represents the greatest threat, and then fire away at the model that is the easiest to hit. And once again, it is possible to shoot at models that are knocked down or stunned, but you may also ignore them to try and shoot at a more immediate threat. Just as with fantasy, you may not shoot at models that are in hand-to-hand -hand combat because the risk of hitting your own guy is too high. The rules for shooting, however, are slightly different if you have an elevated position more than two inches off of the ground, whether you're on a building, a plankway, in a tower, etc. In this case, when you are elevated in this manner, the shooter may shoot at any target that he or she desires. Cover. The many walls, ruined buildings, and other masonry in Mordheim offer plenty of cover. If any portion of the target is hidden by a piece of scenery or another model, the shooting model will suffer a penalty as explained below. So in this case, were our archer to be shooting here, this model would have no cover whatsoever, and that model would be considered having cover, so a minus one shooting penalty would apply. It is important to remember that it does not matter how much of the target is in cover. The model that is shooting always suffers a minus one to hit modifier. So in the case of these two orcs, even if this guy on the right only has a part of a leg and a torso under cover, he still receives the same minus one benefit as the other orc. Once again, in cases like these, it is important to get down and actually look from the view of the model itself to see if the targets are in fact in cover or not. Once again, were our model to have an elevated position more than two inches above the ground, he is free to fire at any target that he so chooses. The one exception to this rule is if there is an enemy model in the same building. So for example, this archer will need to be firing at that orc. Once again, there is no pre-measuring in Mordheim, so once you take your archer and you select your target, you then have to measure the distance to make sure that that target is within the maximum range of the weapon. If the target is within the range of the weapon, we can proceed with hitting and wounding. If not, we say that this attack actually misses. To determine whether a shot hits its target, roll a d6. The dice score needed will depend upon how good a shot the firer is, as indicated by his ballistic skill. The chart that we give you here shows the minimum d6 roll needed to score a hit. In this case, we'll say that our archer did not move. He is within short range. Uh, and this guy has no cover, he is out in the open. Now our archer has a ballistic skill of three, which means he needs to get a four on a d6 to hit. And there's a one, that is a miss. Here now are a few of the hit modifiers that change how difficult it is to strike your target. First, if the target is obscured by any kind of scenery or other models, then it counts as being in cover and there is a minus one modifier. That means where we were hitting on fours before, if this were the case, we'd be hitting on fives. Say now that our archer is in long range, which is over half the distance of the weapon, then we also receive a minus one modifier. So in this case, we'd also be hitting on fives. Third, perhaps in the movement phase, we had moved our archer. In that case, we also suffer a minus one penalty for moving and shooting. So we will be hitting on fives. It is also possible to combine these. So say we moved in the movement phase, which gives us a minus one modifier, and we were shooting over here at this guy behind cover, that's another minus one modifier. So whereas we would be hitting on fours normally, we will be now hitting on sixes. 
Now in Mordheim, unlike Fantasy, there's no such thing as hitting on sevens. Some players, however, who play Fantasy like to use that rule. And the reason for that is it allows you a chance to hit even when things are very difficult. So for example, if we were in long range and we moved and this guy had covers, we would be hitting on sevens. And the way to figure out if you hit on a seven is to roll a d6. If you get a six on your first roll, you re-roll that and anything four, five, or six will count as a seven. Now hitting on sevens is not an official rule for Mordheim, so make sure that you talk with your opponent before the game begins to see whether or not you want to use this fantasy rule. Modifiers, however, need not always be negative. In this case, we also have a plus one hit modifier if you are shooting at a large target. So the main body of the target needs to be more than two inches tall or wide, and this includes such targets as buildings and large creatures like ogres. So in this example, if we have not moved and we are in short range, we will say that this ogre, we would normally be hitting on fours, but now because he is a large target, we will be hitting on threes. And there's a hit. Roll to wound. Once you have hit a target, test to see if a wound is inflicted. A shot may fail to cause a wound because it hits part of the target's equipment, just scratches the skin, or causes some very minor injury, which the warrior bravely or stupidly ignores. If you fail to cause a wound, the target is unharmed. For shooting now, the way to determine whether your shot has caused a wound, what you need to do is compare the strength of the weapon with the toughness of the target. In our case, in this example, we have a strength three for the bow and we have a toughness four for the orc. Once we know these, we will have to go to the wound chart. What you want to do is on the left side, locate the weapon strength, in this case, a three, and then go to the top and locate the target's toughness, in this case, a four. You are then able to trace these to the point where they intersect and you will see that in order to wound, you will need a five. Rolling the wound, and that's a six. And a six is a very good roll because it is what in Mordheim is called a critical hit. Let's talk about that now. If you roll a six when rolling the wound for hand-to-hand -hand combat and shooting only, you will cause what is called a critical hit. Roll a d6 and consult the critical hit chart below to determine the damage caused by the critical hit. You should also roll to see whether the target makes its armor save or suffers damage as normal. So for this case, let's consult the critical hit chart and roll it out. And we get a one, which hits a vital part. In this case, the wound is doubled to two wounds. Roll any armor saves before doubling the wound. Let's say for the sake of argument that our orc has light armor on, so he will save on a six, and he saves the wound so it does not go through. Now were he not to make the save, we would then roll two dice to see what the injuries are. In this case, we got a two and a three. When looking at injuries then, we look over at the injury chart. In this case, a two means that our guy is knocked down, and a three means that he is stunned. You will always take the more powerful of the attacks. So in this case, we will say that our guy is stunned and we will place him face down. There are a couple important things to remember with critical hits. If the attacker normally needs six as the wound is targeted, he cannot cause a critical hit. His opponent is simply too tough to suffer a serious injury at the hands of such a puny creature. And in addition, each warrior may only cause one critical hit in each hand-to-hand -hand combat phase. See the close combat section for more details about this. So if he has several attacks, the first six you roll to wound will cause a critical hit, and none of the others will. So if we return back to the critical hit chart, you can see that the higher the number, the better the effect. So first of all, one, two means you hit a critical part. You double the wounds, but armor saves are allowed. Three to four, you hit an exposed spot. The wound is doubled to two wounds, but the attack ignores all armor saves. And best of all is five to six, the master strike. The wound is doubled to two wounds. The attack ignores all armor saves and you gain plus two to any injury rolls. So for example, if you were to roll two ones, that would be two threes instead. A note about armor. Armor can be very expensive, but it can also be good to save your warriors a lot of problems. If your warrior is wearing armor and he suffers a wound, roll a d6. If the dice rolls sufficiently high, the wounding hit has bounced off the armor and has not hurt the wearer at all. The dice score required varies according to the type of armor. 
So for example, here are a few of the most common kinds of armor. If your warrior has light armor, he's able to roll a six to save a wound. If your warrior has heavy armor, he's able to roll a five to save the wound. And if your warrior has gromeral armor, he's able to, to roll a four to save the wound. And of course, a shield will add one additional point to that save. So for example, if you have light armor, you would normally get a six save, but if you have light armor and a shield, you will save on a five or a six. Armor save modifiers. Some weapons are better at penetrating armor than others. A shot from a bow, for example, can be deflected relatively easy. As we see in this example, this bow has a strength of three, and that's not strong enough to actually modify any of the armor. Say, for example, however, that we have a pistol, and say this pistol was strength four. This would then be a minus one save modifier to the armor. So if we say in this case that the orc has light armor and he suffers a wound from this pistol, which is strength four, we would then say that that negates the armor save and means that he gets no such save. And as you see when we go down this chart, the higher the strength of the weapon, the greater the minus save modifier. So a strength four would be minus one, strength five minus two, strength six minus three, strength seven minus four, strength eight minus five, nine plus minus six. And as we will come back to in the combat section, these armor modifiers even apply to hand-to-hand -hand combat. So for example, if this ogre is attacking with strength four, for example, that would still give a minus one modifier to the light armor of this orc. Injuries. Most models now have a wounds characteristic of one, but some have a value of two or more. If the target has more than one wound, then deduct one from his total each time he suffers a wound. Make a note on the roster sheet. So long as the model has at least one wound remaining, he may continue to fight. Another good way to mark wounds is simply to add a dice next to the figurine that says how many wounds are remaining. As soon as the fighter's wounds are reduced to zero, roll to determine the extent of his injuries using the injury chart. The player who inflicted the wound rolls a d6 for the wound that reduced the model to zero wounds, and for every wound the model receives after that. If a model suffers several wounds in one turn, roll once for each of them and apply the highest result. So for example, this guy right here has only one wound. Say that we actually wound him. We will now determine his extent of injury. Let's roll a d6 and compare it uh, to the chart. A six is out of action. So what that means then is that we will remove the guy from the playing field. A one or two means that he is knocked down, so we place him on his back to show that. On a roll of three, four, we have stunned the target. He falls to the ground where he lies wounded and barely conscious. Turn the model face down to show that he has been stunned. And again, on a five or six, we remove the model as out of action. Knock down models. A model that has been knocked down such as this orc has fallen down or has a jarring blow which means that he is unable to get up immediately. So we turn the model face up to show that he has been knocked down. Now during the movement phase, a knocked down model may crawl up to two inches during the movement phase, but he may not fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, shoot, or cast any spells. If the knockdown figurine is in base contact with an enemy, a knockdown model can crawl two inches away only if the enemy is engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with another opponent. Otherwise, he has to stay where he is. In this case, the archer is fighting another orc, so he may crawl away two inches. Were there no other combat, the orc would need to stay here where he is. In combat, the knockdown figurine cannot strike back, and the enemy will have a good chance of putting him out of action. We'll explain this a little bit more uh, when we talk about the warrior's knockdown section of the close combat rules. At the start of the orc's next turn, a warrior who has been knocked down may stand up during the recovery phase, uh, but what that means is that he may move at half rate, uh, shoot and cast spells, but he cannot charge or run. So in this case, were these two not engaged in combat, and were he to stand up, he would then be able to move half of his uh, movement rate, he would be able to shoot and cast spells. Were he, however, to stand up into hand-to-hand -hand combat, this would mean that he would not be able to move away, and he will automatically strike last. 
irrespective of weapons or initiative. In the next round after this, the fighter moves and fights normally even though he has zero wounds left. If the model takes any further wounds, then roll once again on the injury chart to see uh, exactly what kind of injury the model sustains. Stunned Warriors. When a warrior is stunned, he is either badly injured or temporarily knocked out. Turn the model face down to show that he has been stunned. A fighter who is stunned may do nothing at all. A player may turn the model face up in the next recovery phase and the warrior is then treated as being knocked down. Out of action. A warrior who is out of action is also out of the game. Remove the model from the tabletop. It's impossible to tell at this point whether the warrior is alive or dead, but for game purposes it makes no difference at this stage. Simply remove the piece and we will figure out what happens to him at the end of the game. A brief word about magic. Different kinds of wizards use different kinds of magic. So for example, Sisters of Sigmar and Warrior Priests use the magic type Prayers of Sigmar. Necromancers use the type of magic Necromancy. At the start of games, each wizard starts with one randomly determined spell, but they may gain more. Roll a d6 and consult the appropriate chart to see which spell it is. If you get the same spell twice, if you have the ability for two spells, roll again or lower the spell's difficulty by one. So for example, if we say for this example that what we have here is a Skaven Eshin Sorcerer, we will look at the table for Magic of the Horned Rat and roll a d6. And with the roll of a 6, we will get the Sorcerer's Curse. This spell has a difficulty of 6 and it has a range of 12 inches and affects a single model within range. The target must re-roll any successful armor saves and to hit rolls during the Skaven hand-to-hand -hand phase and his own next shooting and hand-to-hand -hand combat phases. Let's run through an example now of casting a spell. Remember now that spells are cast in the shooting phase and they can be used even if the caster is in hand-to-hand -hand combat. To use a spell, the wizard must roll equal to or greater than the spell's difficulty score on a 2d6. If we remember now, the Sorcerer's Curse had a difficulty of 6, and we will now cast it from this uh, Sorcerer over here onto this Orc using 2d6. 5 was not equal to or greater than the difficulty, so we will say that this spell has failed. Had we rolled something like a 9, this would have been successful, which means the, the spell would have gone off, and this orc then would need to re-roll any successful armor saves and to hit rolls during the Skaven hand-to-hand -hand phase and his own next shooting and hand-to-hand -hand combat phases. A wizard may cast one spell per turn and may not use missile weapons if he wants to cast a spell. He can, however, run and cast spells. Some spells cause direct damage and are resolved the same way as damage from shooting or blows in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Spells do not cause critical hits. Models always receive armor saves against wounds caused by spells unless noted otherwise. Close Combat Models whose bases are touching are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This can only happen once a warrior has charged his enemy, as models are otherwise not allowed to move into contact. In the close combat phase now, all models will be allowed the chance to fight. A warrior can fight against enemies to his side, front, or rear. In reality, the fighters are constantly moving, dodging, and weaving as they struggle to kill their adversaries. So what this means is that when you're playing Mordheim, there's a difference from fantasy and that you are not going to be suffering from fighting to the rear or to the side. It is important to remember that if you are in combat such as these two and you are an archer with ranged weapons, you are not allowed to shoot while you are in combat. Who can strike first? In Mordheim, the model that is allowed to strike first is the one that was able to pull off a successful charge. So if this guy, for example, charged that orc, then that archer would begin regardless of their initiatives. Otherwise, if we don't have any charges, we go after initiative order. Say this archer has an initiative of 3 and the orc has an initiative of 2, then the archer will begin and the orc will then strike after him. 
With tied initiatives, roll off a d6 to see who will begin. Let's say that these two over here have the same initiative of three. We'll say this is the black dice, this is the white dice. Let's roll it off to see the white dice will get the start. And remember, of course, that if a model stood up in the recovery phase and is still in combat, that model will always strike last in the combat, regardless of its initiative. Which models fight? A model can fight if its base is touching the base of an enemy model. Even models attacked from the side or rear can fight. If a warrior is touching more than one enemy, he can choose which to attack. If he has more than one attack, he can divide them in any way the player wishes, so long as he makes this clear before rolling to hit. In this case now, we see that this archer is in base contact with both of these orcs. Now, had this archer had two attacks, he could divide them, putting one on each if he would like, or two on a single one. Once we are now in base contact and we are prepared to hit the enemy, we may now roll 1d6 for each attack that the model has. In the case of the Empire Archer, we have one attack, so we will roll one die. To determine now whether the Archer hits, we will have to compare the weapon skill of the Archer, which in this case is a 3, versus the weapon skill of the Orc, which is also a 3. Having determined the weapon skill of each, we may now look at the two hit chart. The first thing to do is to find the attacker's weapon skill on the left, in this case a 3, and find the opponent's weapon skill on the top, also a 3, and come to the point where they converge. And what we see now is that we need 4s to hit. Rolling now to hit. And that is a 2, that will be a miss. With the archer having missed now, the orc now has an opportunity to attack back. So we compare his weapon skill to that of the archer, once again 3 to a 3. So he will also need 4s to hit. And he also misses. A couple of brief notes about weapons. Some warriors may be able to carry two weapons, one in each hand. In this case, a warrior armed with two one-handed weapons may make one extra attack with the additional weapon. So this orc might be modeled to show this, that he has two weapons. And that will be clear when you are buying the gear for your warband. In other cases, a warrior might be armed with two different weapons. For example, a sword and a dagger. And he will then have to make a single attack with, with whichever weapon he chooses. And all others with the remaining weapon. So roll to hit and wound for each weapon separately. Weapon modifiers. Unlike hits from shooting, the strength of the attacker is used to determine wounds rather than that of the weapon itself. However, some weapons confer a bonus on the attacker's strength. Make sure you just read about the weapons when you arm your warbands to see which weapons do what and the strength of each weapon. Let's continue on now with this combat where we left off. Let's say for the sake of this example that we indeed rolled a 4 when we were attacking with the archer, which is enough to hit. At this point we will now have to roll to wound. In order to determine if we have wounded now, we will need to compare the strength of the attacker with any weapon modifiers versus that of the toughness of the target. Let's say for this example now that the archer is just using normal weapons and he has a strength of 3 when he attacks and our orc has a toughness of 4. Once we have determined these values, we may then look to the wound chart. Let's begin by finding the attacker's strength on the left side, a 3 in this case, and go to the top and find the target's toughness, in this case a 4, and move to the point uh, where they converge and we see that we will need to roll 5s in order to wound. Rolling now for one hit, and that's a four, so there is no wound. Let's say for this case that the archer did hit with a five. Now we would be able to take any armor saves for the defender. In this case, we're going to use a different model, a different figurine here, and we'll say that he has light armor plus a shield. So he will be saving on a five and a six. And there is a five, so that is a successful save of that wound, no damage done. And just as with shooting, there are also armor save modifiers depending upon the strength of the attack. We can use the same chart to show you this. If we take the strength of the attacker plus any modifiers for the weapon, we see that on a 1 to 3 there are no modifiers, but on a 4 a minus 1, 5 minus 2, 6 minus 3, 7 minus 4, 8 minus 5, and 9 plus minus 6. So for example, had we been using a weapon here that gave 1 plus 
uh, to the strength of the archer in his attack, his strength would now be a four, which would meet a minus one modifier to the armor and the shield save of this orc. Thus, instead of saving on a five or six, he would now only be able to save on a six. And in this case, he would have failed and suffered the wound. The parry. Bucklers are small shields which offer no increase to the armor saving throw, but allow you to parry attacks. Swords are also used to parry enemy attacks. The way this works is that when an opponent scores a hit, warriors equipped with bucklers or swords may try to parry the blow. What you will need to do is to roll a d6. If the score is higher than the number your opponent rolled to hit, the buckler or sword has parried the strike. Note that it is therefore impossible to parry a blow which scored a 6 on the roll to hit. So for example, if the roll to hit were a 4, and we had a buckler or a sword, and we rolled a parry of a 5, then we would have successfully parried that attack, and it would not have gone through. And it is important to note that a buckler or sword may only parry one blow per hand-to-hand -hand combat phase. If your opponent scored several hits, you will have to try to beat the highest score. And if the highest score is a 6, you automatically lose the chance of parrying that opponent's attacks. Likewise, if you are fighting against several opponents, you may only parry the strike from the enemy who makes the first hit or hits. Warriors Knocked Down If an enemy is fighting a warrior who is knocked down, he may attack him to put him out of his misery. All attacks against a warrior who is knocked down hit automatically. If any of the attacks wound the knocked down model and he fails his armor save, he is automatically taken out of action as explained previously. A knocked down model may not parry. So in this example, we have the orc who is knocked down on his back face up, and we have the archer here attacking. If he's attacking, he automatically hits. He will then be wounding on a five, and that is a wound, which means he is automatically removed from the game. In contrast, a stunned warrior is at the mercy of his enemies. A stunned model is automatically taken out of action if an enemy can attack him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So were this the combat here and the archer were attacking this orc, the archer would simply be able to take him out of combat by attacking him. It is important to note that if an attacking model has more than one hit, it is not possible then to knock down or stun that model and remove him in the same turn. It is nevertheless possible that you are able to remove a model if you are working together with more than one attacking model in that combat phase. So in this example, we may have the archer here who is able to attack this orc and to stun him. And then when it is this turn for this archer to attack, he can then take him out of action. In this sense, by working together, you are able to remove models in one turn. It is important to remember that if you are in combat like this archer and you have a model who is knocked down or stunned and another one who is standing, this archer cannot attack that one but instead must erect his attack against the standing opponent. Remember, you will always attack the model that has a greater threat. Once models are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they cannot move away during their movement phase. They must fight until they are either taken out of action, until they take out their enemies, or until one or the other breaks and runs. The exception to this rule, however, is if in this combat, for example, the archer is fighting the two orcs and both of them are either stunned or knocked down, then the archer would be free to move out of that combat. In addition, not only can he move out of the combat, but during his movement phase he may declare a charge against a new enemy and charge out of that combat into a brand new combat. Breaking from combat. A warrior who panics while fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat will break off and make a run for it, as described in the Leadership and Psychology section, which we will cover in a little bit. When a fighter breaks from combat, he simply turns around where he is, and he runs off 2d6, and each of the remaining warriors now are able to inflict one hit, which is worked out immediately. Note that warriors cannot choose to leave a fight voluntarily, but they can only do so when they break. Leadership and Psychology The Route Test 
A player must make a route test at the start of his turn if a quarter, that is 25% or more of his warband is out of action. Take for example this Skaven warband. Let's say initially that they had 8 warriors in their warband and in the last uh, turn in combat they were dropped down to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now they have lost 25% of their warband. In their turn now they will have to roll for the route test. If the route test is failed, the warband automatically loses the fight. The game ends immediately and surviving warriors retreat from the area. A failed route test is the most common way in which a fight in Mordheim ends. To take the route test, we will now roll 2d6 and compare it to the leadership of the leader, or if the leader is dead, the highest leadership of the next individual left on the board. Let's say for this uh, case that we are going to be using a leadership of 6. So what that means now is in our 2d6 roll, we need to be able to roll equal to or less than the warband leader's leadership. And here is the route test. So that would be an 8, that means that the Skaven would then rout and flee off the battlefield, thus ending the game. Once again, if your leader in your group is either stunned or out of action, you are unable to use his leadership and must move to the next highest leadership. Voluntary Rout Once two or more of the warband are out of action, a player may voluntarily abandon the battle at the start of any of his own turns. So for example, if this Skaven has the turn now, and let's say they lost two uh, of their warriors who are now out of action, they may choose in their turn now, because they are down two to only six, to voluntarily route and leave the battlefield. Sometimes this is the most advantageous thing to do, because you might be able to run off with some treasure and some loot and avoid losing any more of your warriors. Any warrior within 6 inches of his leader may use his leader's leadership value when taking leadership tests. This is the leader's ability to encourage his warriors and push them beyond normal limits. So if this is our leader for the Skaven army, we may say then that this clan rat is able to use the leader's leadership. The rest of them, however, must use their own leadership for any leadership tests. If, however, the leader is himself knocked down, stunned, or fleeing, he cannot confer this bonus on anyone else. The sight of your leader running for cover is obviously far from encouraging. All alone. Being outnumbered and all alone in Mordheim is a nerve-wracking situation for any warrior. If your warrior is fighting alone against at least two opponents, in this case our archer is fighting against three clan rats, and if no friendly troops are within six inches, in this case we are beyond the six inch range, then your warrior must take a test at the end of his combat phase. The test is taken against the model's leadership on 2d6. If the warrior scores equal to or under his leadership, his nerve holds. If the score is greater than his leadership, the warrior breaks from combat and runs. So at the end of this combat, we may roll 2d6, and we see that we have an 8, which means that our archer will lose his nerve and run. The reason for that is that he has a leadership of 7, and we rolled over his leadership. In running then, the archer will turn away from his enemies and make a 2d6 move as fast as he can away from them. As he does so, however, each of the three Skaven that were engaged in combat get to attack one automatic hit against the archer, so for a total of three hits. Say we have a strength three against a toughness of three, we would roll these three out, and we would see that we would in fact be wounding him and taking him out of action. If a warrior such as this archer is charged while he is fleeing, the charger is moved into base contact as normal. But the fleeing warrior will then continue to run a further 2d6 inches towards the table edge before any blows can be struck. So that will be a total of 9 more inches for that archer. Fear Fear is a natural reaction to huge or unnerving creatures. A model must take a fear test, that is, a test against his leadership, in a couple of situations. In this example, we will be saying that the ogre here will be charging this archer, and we will say that the ogre is causing fear. It is important to note, however, that creatures that themselves cause fear can ignore these tests. 
First, a fear test needs to be taken if the model here is charged by a warrior or a creature which causes fear. Once the ogre declares its charge, we will then need to take a leadership test here and we will say a leadership of seven. If we fail like we do here with two sixes, that means now that uh, this model will have to roll sixes to score hits on the first round of combat. Had the archer passed with say a four, then he would be able to fight in combat as normal. Second, if this model, the archer, decides to charge the ogre, and if the ogre causes fear, then the archer must roll in order to see if he can overcome his fear in order to successfully make the charge. On a leadership of seven, and he fails it again. What this then means is that he is unable to pull off the charge that he declared, and he must then remain stationary for the turn. Treat this as a failed charge. Had the archer been successful in his leadership test, say if he rolled a three, he would then be able to complete his charge like normal. Frenzy. If a model has a special rule of frenzy, it must always charge if there are any enemy models within charge range. You check after charges have been declared. The player has no choice in this matter. The warrior will automatically declare a charge. In this case, if we assume that this orc boy has frenzy, then he will have to declare a charge. In this case, he is within charge range, so he will declare a charge and pull off a charge against that empire warrior. One benefit of frenzy is that frenzied warriors fight with double their attacks characteristic in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So for example, warriors with one attack like this orc therefore have two attacks. Warriors with two attacks have four, etc. If a warrior is carrying a weapon in each hand, he receives plus one attack for this as normal. This attack is not doubled. So let's say in this case, we usually have one attack for the orc, but because he is frenzied, he has two attacks now. And let's say he has an additional hand weapon, which would mean that in attacking in this combat, he would have a whopping three attacks. Once they are within charge range, frenzied warriors are immune to all other psychology such as fear and don't have to take these tests as long as they remain within charge range. If a frenzied model is knocked down or stunned at any point, he is no longer frenzied. He loses his frenzy and he continues to fight as normal for the rest of the battle. Hatred. Warriors who fight enemies they hate in hand-to-hand -hand combat may re-roll any misses when they attack in the first turn of each hand-to-hand -hand combat. In this case, we may say that the orc has hatred for the Skaven. In this case, in their combat, if he happens to roll a miss in hand-to-hand -hand combat, he may re-roll that miss when he is attacking. It is important to know that this bonus applies only in the first turn of each combat and represents the warrior venting his pent-up hatred on his foe. After this first round, the two then continue to fight on as normal. So say, for example, this orc is attacking here with two attacks. We'll say he's hitting on fours. And what we have here is one hit and one miss, but because of hatred, he gets to re-roll that one, and that one is also a miss. Stupidity. For the sake of this example, let's just assume that the ogre represented here suffers from stupidity. If a model is stupid, it will need to take a leadership test at the beginning of its turn to see if they are able to overcome their stupidity. To do so, we roll 2d6 and compare that to the leadership. In this case of the ogre bull, we have a leadership of 7. So let's roll that out, and he gets a 9, so he fails that test. A failed test can mean a couple of different things. If the model is in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so for example with this orc, it will not strike any blows during this turn of hand-to-hand -hand combat. In addition, if he is a spell caster and wants to cast a spell, he will not be able to cast any spells this turn. If the model is not in hand-to-hand -hand combat, roll a d6 and compare it to the chart. With the five, the warrior will stand inactive and drool a bit during his turn. He may do nothing else, as drooling is, of course, so demanding. Were we to roll a one, two, or three, the warrior moves directly forward at half rate, stumbling forward, stopping one inch away from any enemy. Were he at the edge of a sheer drop, he could indeed fall off of that 
edge. See the following rules for how to work out damage. Were he to move into an obstacle, he would then immediately stop. The model, of course, will not be able to shoot this turn. And once again, as with our example, if we were to roll a 4, 5, or 6, the warrior would stand inactive and drool a bit during this turn. He wouldn't do anything else than just stand there. And with that, we come to the conclusion of the basic rules for Mordheim. There are, however, many more specific rules in the Mordheim Living Rulebook that you can look up when you are putting together your warbands and fighting your battles. For example, rules for weapons and armor can be found on pages 24, 25, 26, and 27. Rules for missile weapons can be found on pages 28, 29, and 30. Rules for black powder weapons can be found on pages 31, 32, and 33. Rules for armor are found on pages 34 and 35. And all of these fun rules for the miscellaneous equipment can be found on pages 36, 37, 38, and 39. Part of what makes Mordheim a really interesting game is that over the course of fighting numerous battles, you can build up your warbands, you can get more money, and you can buy all sorts of different weapons, armor, and items that will contribute to your battles. The remainder of the Living Rulebook has some really good information that you can use as you begin with your warbands and fight your campaigns. So starting on page 46, we have information about the different kinds of warbands, how to construct a warband, how these different warbands may look. On page 77 and forward, we have various campaigns that you can run. And also on page 115 to the end, we have optional rules that you may use to make your Mordheim games even more intense, exciting, and multi-layered. In conclusion, the basic rules that we have provided you with here should be more than enough for you to begin to jump in to the world of Mordheim, to begin your warbands, and to begin to have fantastic adventures and battles in the Mordheim universe. Thank you for joining us here today at Grey Army Gaming. May your Mordheim games be glorious.